This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale Live demo at www.rationale-online.com. The Staff Canteen now has its own shop, so you can get your hands on as much merch as you want. From mugs, t-shirts, to these hoodies, which you'll see myself and any of the guests on our podcast wearing throughout. Go and take a look. The link is below. And please do give us a thumbs up if you do decide to purchase anything. Finally, we are giving away one hoodie per episode for the next six episodes with my co-host, Daniel Clifford. You can find out how to win at the end of this podcast. Welcome to the Staff Canteen podcast with Cara. Her language is terrible, but don't be offended. It's worth a listen because this day and age, everybody swears apart from myself. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat on the roof whenever I want to eat on the roof, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had the biggest, fluffiest beard, and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it, and I just remember that, of course, a bit bizarre. Why are you in your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly munch it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. I'm dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around <laughs> their mouth. Uh, welcome to Grilled, a podcast by The Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Staff Canteen. And this is our second episode in our mini-series, uh, co-hosted by Daniel Clifford. Daniel, what's new to report from you this week? I think we've had an extremely busy week at midsummer. Um, I had uh, a lot of gypsies outside my restaurant last weekend, which was a lot of fun. But <laughs> I'll be totally honest with you, I think, uh, for me... Uh, it's taking in the news what Boris Johnson has announced this week of uh, no face masks and we're going about our own way on the 19th. And I think, to be honest with you, today has been a lot of discussions in the kitchen of uh, how we move forward as a business and how we protect ourselves. Yeah, how are you feeling about that, that announcement? Is uh, that well, we're, we're, we're going to keep face coverings on the uh, front of house staff because I need to protect them. It's my role to protect them. Uh, we are going to drop the face masks in the kitchen, but um, anyone coming into the kitchen will be face masks, so I'm keeping my staff in a bubble. But, you know, I, I, um, it's going to be interesting because up until this point, we've been extremely busy. I am, I'm not worried about the business level. I'm more worried about uh, my younger staff going out disco dancing down the nightclubs and... Uh, and um, the mingling, because that's going to bring COVID into my restaurant. And then the isolating and, and all of them situations is going to have a big effect to the business. Because, yeah. you know, you don't, you, you don't have enough uh, money in the payroll to keep extra staff on the side just in case other people are sick. These businesses are run where everybody is... Uh, a part of that cog that makes the wheel go round and you take one out for a holiday, it's bad enough. You take three or four out and the business model is changing. And I think that's the difficulty of how do we uh, approach going forward with that? Yeah, so excitement, but caution, I feel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, so Daniel, please introduce our guest and tell us uh, why you wanted him to join us. Well, uh, Sophie and... Um, he came to eat here probably about five or six years ago. He came, uh, he was working at the Hand and Flowers as uh, a senior chef de party. Came to Midsummer House to eat, loved it. Came back for a trial with a recommendation from Tom. Uh, came in, there was this, this, there was a bit of swagger about him. He's a confident boy. Um, he, uh, not many people become my favourites. Normally, uh, there is a favourite in the kitchen. It's not a favourite as in a favourite that uh, he gets away with more. I would say he becomes my right-hand man. Mark is the boss of the kitchen. And Sophie and sort of becomes the person wherever I go, he goes. And he, um, you know, if we did maintenance, we did it together. If we did projects outside, we did it together. And I saw someone grow within my business to someone who was very special. I always knew he was going to be great, but um, 
you never know if they're going to last the course. And then he left me, went to uh, a restaurant in Ireland and helped them uh, uh, gain their first Michelin star in their first year of him being there. And then obviously COVID's hit and he's, he's, he's decided it's time for him to do something himself. And he's taken over a restaurant in London called, I think it's uh, Omar. Orma. 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 So, yeah, Orma. I didn't tell him to change the name, they wouldn't have it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but do you know, um, there was a point when, uh, what people don't know about this is Mark uh, came to me about probably three or four years ago, just before he took, uh, we, we just before he took the directorship role at Midsummer House and took shares in the business, he actually came to me and said that, um, you know, chef, I think it's time for me to move on. And uh, Sophie was the first person I called. And I, I said to him, Sophie, do you want to go, oh, chef, I don't think I'm ready for it. I don't think I'm ready for it. And there was me, like, I had everything crossed that if Mark was going to leave, he was going to be the one to step in. So that's how much I believe in him. I, I think he's he's at a level in, in this industry that he's going to produce something very special very quickly. And I think he's going to put that restaurant on the map. And I think they're very lucky to have him. Sophie, and welcome to Grill. Oh, what an intro. Thanks for having me. I know, I'm flattered. Jeez, I'm <laughs> blushing as well. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, what we're going to do is just a few um, just fun questions. All I need you to do is choose a number between, I've gone from one to six this, this week. So yep. any number between one and six, and I will let you know what the question is. So Sophie, you can go first. Yeah, number two. What's the most useless talent that you have? Um, Jesus. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a, of, a, of a talent that I have, let alone a useless one. Um, <laughs> I, I, I honestly can't think of one. I'll put can't you on the spot there. She's very clean, Sophie, yeah. I know, I, I, just, <laughs> this is I know what came into my head, but I really I can't think. You put in too much thought into it. Can I do another number? Can I do another no. number? No, because that means I get that one. That's a ter it's a terrible one, that. It's well, terrible. Yeah, I think you need to answer it. <laughs> I can open bottles with my teeth. Like, you know, like a, a, a can of, a bottle of beer or whatever it is with my mouth. There you go. That, that's a, yeah. that's some, that's a It's quite useful. It is quite <laughs> useful. <laughs> Isn't until your teeth drop out. No, I've got, well, yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> right, Daniel. I'll have number one, please. Who is the messiest head chef that you've worked for? Oh, um, <laughs> that's a tough one as well, isn't it? No, um, probably the first guy I worked for, a bloke called Andrew Leach. He, uh, small kitchen. Uh, I was the plonger stroke commie. And yeah, he used to burn uh, quite a few pans. Yeah, I, he wasn't at the level that we're at. So uh, he was, uh, yeah, he, his okay. wife was a vegan. I, you know, with all due respect, can't get me head around it. Do you think that's where your issue with vegans <laughs> stems from? No, I don't have an issue with vegans. I don't have an issue with vegans. I'll be honest with you, I eat vegetables a lot myself. It's not, uh, I'm not against it. I just think the other day is, is, it's all part of a healthy diet, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is, it is. <laughs> I'm going to change this next time. I'm going like, to become like part of the vegan society. <laughs> I don't think they'll let you in. <laughs> no, I don't either. Not a child. <laughs> So if you can give me another number. Uh, four. Okay, the best and the worst piece of kitchen equipment that you've ever purchased. Uh, best would be a Vitamix. Yeah, I'd say Vitamix is the, is the best and the worst. You know, actually, yeah, you know one of those peelers, I, they, they do the adverts for them on, 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 on TV and that, and they sort of, you have different attachments for them. One does spaghetti, one does like something That's else. Clean you know Easy I'm... magazine, that chief. Yeah, yeah, that one, yeah. <laughs> one of the lads has one of them, they're terrible. <laughs> they're terrible, okay. you can't, they, they literally don't peel anything, they just break. Okay. <laughs> and they're made of plastic. <laughs> so don't, get... don't buy one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel. Uh, number six, please. What is the most unprofessional thing you've seen someone do? This is, I saw this uh, in a restaurant in Leeds 
Um, uh, we had 140 as a wedding party in, and we had Valentina chicken, so it's a leg that's been stuffed with like a morel and sweetbread mousseline, rolled up in tin foil, and then you would poach them, and then you'd roast it afterwards. And because we had this wedding, um, I was told not to, to have two stock pots full of water and drop 70 into each pan. But uh, me being me, I was following the advice from someone else. And that chef told me to um, not to put them in until uh, we'd sent the Amers Bouche, but they only had Amers Bouche starter and then main course. And basically dropping uh, 70 Ballantines into each pan made the pan of water go stone cold. And um, when I turned around about 15 minutes later and said, chef, these aren't cooking, we're just about to send the starters. He took the bullseyes out of both solid tops and dropped them in the pans. Yeah. And obviously uh, that made them boil very quickly. <laughs> but also wrote off about 30 of the Ballantines as it went through the water. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that was probably the worst cowboy trick I've seen. What not to do. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're in we've got um five or three i take five so if you could know the absolute and total truth to one question what question would you ask uh probably coronavirus if i'm being honest oh good shout yeah i'd say so i'd say so yeah 100 it's 100 percent. yeah what, what happened where did it <laughs> go wrong and daniel which yeah, body part would what which body part wouldn't you mind losing? After five kids, I think I'd have a snip. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, it's probably time for that to happen. So yeah, that's probably the job. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I've got one final question for you, Sophian. So mm. we our previous guest, uh, Michael. Viljan, and I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, um, from Restaurant Chapter One was on yeah. with us last time, and yeah. he left us a question for you. So I'm Michael Villian from Restaurant Chapter One by Michael Villian, and I'd like to know, how are you going to make it better for your staff? I think just in, in general, we, you know, we, we, when, we, when we first took over and when we first opened, we sort of adopted the mentality of it being a nice environment to work in. It was one of the most important things, especially with everything going on. So, you know, it they are long hours. People work long hours. I don't think if you want to cook at a high level, you can get away from that too much. You know, you can do the odd bit. Um, but we make we make we make it a nice environment. So it's not a sort of nervous energy when you come into work. You don't want to we don't want people to come to work dreading to come in because it doesn't last. You know, people don't stick around. So that's that's the, the main thing that we work on. <laughs> is for it to be a, a nice environment. Okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, that actually leads me on to something I want to talk to you about anyway, because uh, you recently yeah. did an article with us, and one yeah. of your quotes is that you can work long hours and be happy, and you just have to really like cooking, and I really, really like it. And um, I, some people thought that was like really refreshing and very quite cool to hear, and other people obviously then said, but you shouldn't have to work those long hours. So I just yeah. wanted you know, just yeah. wanted to talk to you about it. Do you still need to commit that to the industry? The, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think if you want to, that, that's the, the thing that it is. If you, if, you, you, if you cook at a high level, whatever, it, it's, it takes sacrifice and it takes a lot of your time and it takes hours and that's, that's part of it. But I think if you're happy in doing it and you know, you're, you're, you're challenged, your staff are challenged in the right way, um, and they enjoy coming to work. It really doesn't seem like you're working long hours. Do you know what I mean? And you enjoy it and you're, you're excited to come to work. And that, to me, that's what's important because I, I think you, to achieve certain things, you do need to put the work in. It's not just going to happen. Oh, how, 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 how do you, um, so your restaurant opens at 12. Yeah. Your last, your last booking's at two. Someone yeah. orders a tasting menu. Your tasting menu is three and a half hours long. That means that them customers are going to be leaving about half past four. Then your next service starts at six and dinner service is always a bit longer because the menu is a bit longer because you're trying to increase the revenue you're bringing into the business. So you've already, so just, just that first lunchtime is four and a half hours. So say dinner is a five and a half hour service. You're already up to nine hours just in service time 
looking after guests when they're in. Where does the prep get done? Well, this is the thing that I don't think people quite understand. That if, you know, that's just, I'm, I agree with you that if, if, if your lunch service for 40 people starts at 12, you don't roll in at 11 o'clock and just, you know, but you can't. Everything's ready. The so thing is, is as, as, as a head chef, with, um, you know, being a head chef is people look at that and they say to you, oh, you know, that you've, you've reached the pinnacle of your career. And I remember when you worked under me, I said to you, so it ain't all uh, bells and whistles at the top, chef. You know, uh, yeah, that is, is yeah, the yeah. higher up you go, the more uh, difficulty it gets because you're dealing with bigger problems. Yeah, and, yeah, problems and there's more of them. And the, well, they, they come through the door uh, yeah, with a postman. But the end of the day is, 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 my point is, if, like, I'll use you for an example, yeah? You, you're, you've been brought in, you, first of all, you're one of the most driven people I know, but also, you, you've gone to an establishment that wants to achieve accolades, they want to achieve a level of service and consistency with the food, they don't want it to be a mediocre restaurant, they want to compete with a certain level, which the hotel yep. puts themselves at, Yes. Now, the other day is, that means, realistically, you want to see every single plate of food that goes out of that kitchen. Yeah. That means you are going to be there every single service. So that means the business yeah. either sacrifices uh, days of the week where so they can give you a balance. So, But the other day is, as I just pointed out, even if you just did the actual service with no prep, you're still talking about 10 hours a day. Now, yeah. if that's five days a week, that's 50 hours. Now, that's just the service for the head chef. Now, the end of the day is, that's just for him to stand there and micromanage every plate going out. But we all know that this, business, not, we all know that this business is not, a, it's not about the service. The service is the easy bit. The prep is the hardest bit because yeah. that's when the biggest mistakes get made. Yeah. Well, you and you, you can't just. Well, I don't think I. You can't just walk into the service and expect everything to have gone right and everything to be as it should be for the last four hours when you haven't been there. Well, how does it make it fair for the people that's been there before you? You you either in there with them, leading them. Of course, yeah, no, and and that's that's or the you point. Have two what, teams. I mean, I, I I wouldn't want to work for someone who wasn't willing to work as hard as me, if that makes sense. Completely. So I think you have a you have a you have a responsibility to you, you want to ask if you want people to work that hard for you you have to be doing it yourself. That, and that's that's I believe in that. Oh, I'm a hundred percent behind that. I, I I still still follow that through every day. But my point is, the thing is, is chefs' lives. It's such a social work. You work. You're socialising with your colleagues on a daily basis. Yes. yes. The more uh, I've been in this industry, the more when I'm off on a Sunday or on a Monday, I'm more of a hermit. Yeah. I go away and I don't want to be with people. I want to be with the people that I love, but I don't want to be surrounded by other people because the end of the day is the questioning and the, you know, is this right? Is that right? Is this right? Are we doing this? We're doing that. Yeah. You don't want to be questioned anymore. You just want to uh, put your feet up and relax and turn off. Do you think the next generation are prepared to do what you've said though? You know, put those hours in, do they understand it? Is it, or is it just gonna see a shift, complete shift and change in people's attitudes to, to, um, to how much they want to work? I, I guess it's, it's, it's all dependent because I think it gets a lot of a bad press that if, if you're a chef um, and you work in a really, really good restaurant, then you're gonna get work to the bone. You're gonna be miserable and that's your life, but it's not the case at all. Um, and I, I think it, it just gets it gets bad press, and and people are, a lot of people jump on a bandwagon and and say so many things about the industry. But you know, I think I I think something needs you know it, it's the most rewarding job you can have. I think so. I I don't, and I don't think people are told about it. I don't think people in colleges or you know from from the very beginning are, are told how rewarding it can be if you do, you know, really, really focus yourself in it. Um, but yeah. It, but is that think, not the same in any industry? What, what do you mean? What, what part well, of it? I, you know, 
I've got friends who work for banks. I've got friends who work yeah, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. at the top of their career. They've got deadlines. They have to, you know, I've got people who work at banks that stay up till one o'clock in the morning trying to hit their deadlines because they've got workloads that they need to do. And their bonuses are related on their deadlines. So they carry on working because they want to achieve that. They want to move up 100%. the ladder. The thing is, is... But it's you in know, any walk of life. If you want to, if you really want to be successful in anything, you you can't really get away with doing hours not, the, not the bare minimum, but you have to go a bit above and beyond. And that's it's just the way it is. Otherwise, everyone would be really, really successful, and everyone would have restaurants, and everyone would be rich. Do you know what I mean? But it's you have to, you have to you only put in you only get out what you put in. Yeah, I'd completely but, but, agree. You know, but for some reason, hospitality gets a, a bit of bad press for it. Um, you know. Yeah. So obviously, you two, you know each other. What are the what are the major differences in your journeys as chefs? Are they are they completely different? How did you come into it, Sophie and Like, um, how did you both get to where you are now? Mine was a it was a complete mistake. I was I had left school uh, a few years early. I wasn't very good in school um I didn't have any work so I started washing up complete com just for money purely um and it was a complete accident um and then I just loved it and I took it from there and sort of found out that there was you know amazing restaurants around that you could work in um which I didn't even know about these places before I'd sort of looked into it and watched YouTube videos and stuff and it just sort of went on from there and every place that I worked in, I knew that after a certain amount of time, I wanted to go and work in another good place or a better place. And it sort of, it was, uh, it just kept on going in that sense. So you didn't start with like a, a passion for food? You, that no, no, not, not, not at all. Honestly, not at all. It was a complete accident. Complete yeah, accident. I, I didn't have a passion for food. Yeah. I grew up on turkey burgers and spaghetti bolognese. And I'll be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you don't mind, mind a turkey burger. No, I don't mind a turkey burger. When you, when you have them from the age of 12 until you're 16, yeah, just, you get bored of them. My mum can't make a salad. <laughs> that, that's the truth. She can't make a salad. And her speciality is banana sandwiches with, with uh, brown sugar. And I lived off that because, yeah, you know, is, is, you know, she can't cook. She wasn't turned to cook. She wasn't taught to cook. And my dad's an engineer and he worked all the hours under the sun. So, um Mine was work experience, went for work experience because hospitality was where they chucked all the misfits. And uh, I went along, loved the atmosphere in the kitchen, thought this is a great place because everyone's working together and you feel important. And I think that that's the key to it. If someone feels valid and value, they've a valuable part of the team, they will stay because they, they, they buzz off it. You, you, you get that drive of success and you feel, you feel like you're achieving something. And I think the other day is, is this is, it becomes an addiction to work in better restaurants because you want to prove to yourself that you can do it. You want to, you want to learn the maximum as you can, because it would be boring, wouldn't it? Imagine, imagine like work, you know, working in McDonald's for 25 years, it drives you nuts, wouldn't it? I'll be totally honest with you. I think, you know, you've got to start somewhere, starting in somewhere like that, but the passion comes out and you want to better yourself. You, 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 you want to show to your family and your friends that, you know, I have chosen to do this, but I'm going to be really good at it. I'm not going to give up. And I think them, them 10 years of training are the key to your success because how much you give it, you give it there is how much it's going to give back to you later. So once you were in it, did you then have a plan of where you wanted to go? with it or was it because you said obviously you wanted to work in better and better restaurants so at what point did you go actually I want to have my own restaurant or I want to be a head chef like what where did that come from for, for me like as, as soon as I worked in uh work I, I think it was when I was with Paul I was with Paul Heathcote that was when I first knew that you know eventually if, I, if I'm going to work this hard and put so much into it then at the end then I want to be able to be in a position that all of these guys that I'm working for in, which is to be able to, you know, eventually to cook your own food and sort of do it, do it for yourself. So it was always, I always knew I wanted to do it. Um, and it sort of, as time went on and I started to believe in myself more and more, um, then yeah, just, I, I knew it was gonna happen. I didn't know when, but I did know it was gonna happen eventually. Um, and, and it has now, I guess. 
it was quite a long one. Uh, went to Canterbury <laughs> University. Do you want the whole lot? Uh, so I went to <laughs> How long is long? I realized, <laughs> realized that. Um, uh, Did you go to? I didn't know you went to university. No, I didn't go to university. I worked in the kitchen at the. Oh, university. you was cooking there. Oh, yeah, I was cooking there for like two thousand people a day, and realized I, mean, I went okay. to college and realized other people were learning a lot better things than me because we were we were um, you know battered battered chicken came in pre battered, and uh, lasagna came in. You know, I was I was more of an oven warmer than I was a, a chef, and. Um, I went to college, realized that these kids working in standalone restaurants were learning so much more than me. That really frustrated me. So uh, I went back to my dad one day and he threw me the yellow pages. That's like to, to all the kids out there. That's what we used to call the internet. And um, <clears throat> and the end of the day is, is uh, the, the, I read through the yellow pages and found the best restaurants in Canterbury and wrote to them. Got an interview uh, and I was very lucky from there he, when I'd done my two years there, he said to me, right, you need to go to these restaurants. And they were Michelin-starred restaurants. And uh, it's sort of, once I was in, I couldn't get out because it became very addictive. And uh, it was, um, did I ever see myself as Daniel I am today? Uh, I saw myself as a good cook, but I didn't see the, when we got one star, I didn't think we were good enough. When we got two stars, it I basically, it's like someone had punched me in the face. I didn't really realize that. And it took me five or six years to get over it. But to believe in yourself, I think that's the hardest thing. I think that's the thing that I didn't have is self-belief because of my career path and people have always told me that I would never be good enough. So it was, that's what pushed me. But this is, uh, there isn't another job that gives you the freedom that this job gives. It, yes, the hours are long, yeah. The, the experience is grueling for some, but you know, I get to taste the best things in the world. I get to cook with the best ingredients in the world. I get the opportunity to go to places other people have never been and only dream of. And uh, you know, as a 15 year old boy that was bunking off school, I had no career prospects and everyone thought he was gonna be a bin man. I think I've done all right. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, I, I feel like I've got more experiences to give my own children. You know, I've been to Colombia. I've been to some amazing places where I, I understand the journey of a coffee bean. I understand the, the journey of uh, a vanilla. vanilla. And, and, and I think that's a beautiful thing because the end of the day is, is food is, first of all, it's the most important job in the world because we all need to eat. And also it gives you a passport to travel the world. And I think that is, it's, it, it's what other career do you get that in? Thank God for the yellow pages. Who knows where you'd have ended up? Well, you know, <laughs> I'd probably done that. I, I, funny enough, when I was 15, I did apply to the little chef. Yeah, because my dad said to me, if I, yeah, he's got a lot to answer for. But <laughs> I promise you, he said to me, son, son, the little chef's looking. Yeah, because I used to like the pancakes with the uh, cherries. Remember the cherry in a ball of ice cream? Delicious. And uh, I, mean, <laughs> I tried to recreate that when he was at the the, the, the flitch with me and we bought the tin cherries and that's disgusting. But uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, your palate changes, doesn't it? You grow up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if you'd obviously we've heard uh, Daniel at the beginning of this tell us a bit about you and him working with you, but what are your what are your memories of working with with Daniel at, at, at Midsummer? Um. I think at the at the beginning it was because it was it was quite a long time ago. I think it's probably six or seven years ago now, um, and it was. I I mean I personally was terrified before I went there. I knew I wanted to work there. I knew that it would be. It's not. I knew it wouldn't be an easy place to work, um, just because I knew it knew it would be sort of you know everything's very regimented, and I could sort. I saw a bit of it on my trial. I was only there for two days, so you don't get to. You don't really get. You don't know that much. You can only get a feel. Um, but I, I, it was no. It was it was good. It was it was there was there was. It, it takes a lot of adjustment to go and work there. It's not like you can just. And I come from a two star, and I'd, I'd walked in there, and I thought I was probably a little bit better than I was, and I was humbled very quickly, very quickly. Um, not in a bad way, but I, I was 
quickly realized that I was nowhere fucking near as good as I thought I was, not even close. Um, but that was okay, because I was still learning, I was still getting better. Um, but it was, it was intense. It was definitely an intense time. It was very busy. Um, but the, the, I think it was the attention to detail that he, the chef had and that Mark had that I, I hadn't seen before. Um, and it was, it, it was, it was difficult. Yeah. If that first eight, eight months, I would say was, was, was humbling and difficult, but it was, you know, I wouldn't, she wouldn't change it for the world because it's, you know, it's, it was an important part of my journey to, uh, to, ex to go through that. Um, to sort of be leveled down a little bit, yeah. What What is your standout story from working with with Daniel? Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ, I don't I don't know what to say with that. <laughs> like, what can I say? Dirty Thursday was probably the, the Dirty Thursday was a rough day. Yeah, that, but that was the first. That was the first time I worked with you. So that was the first day I worked with you, and I was I was like, fuck this, honey. Fucking psycho. Uh, I came back in the kitchen and the kitchen was filthy. Okay. <laughs> but, but th th Thursday was was our, our deep clean day. And, uh, yeah, and it was dirty Thursday. And it, it wasn't the kitchen wasn't clean, was it? So, <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. But I remember you actually. I had I, I'd never worked with you before, so it was the first time I'd properly worked with you. And uh, you always every obviously your apron has to be pretty immaculate when you work at Midsummer. And if it's not, then you you either change it or yeah. And and uh, I remember you sent you sent me home to change my apron. I didn't think it was that dirty, but it was it was a, there was a bit of gear down down the apron. It wasn't that bad, but that was probably the the biggest awakening I had when I came to work to you Dirty Thursday. So it was all it was in the first week. But, What's the, the thing is 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 uh, you know you 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 you're, you're the minute you let your standards drop, is yeah. you've, you've let your standards drop. So the end of the day is you have to, you maintain it and you maintain it. Yeah. And you yourself and the end of the day is is you know um, I would agree exactly what Sophie has just said. I think the end of the day is is it's not it doesn't take you a week to settle into midsummer house. It takes you a minimum of three months. And the end of the day is it, it is. This is we, we run things differently. We, you know, you've got two owners in the kitchen. You've got two people who've invested their life into that kitchen, and I'm in there ninety five percent of the time. So the end of the day, I uh, and I, I don't miss a trick. I don't really miss a lot. So it's it's difficult. You know, if the boards aren't in the right place, I say something. If if the butter pot's not full, I say something. Yeah, you know, uh, but that's because I care. But I also look at the people that have come out of my kitchen. I know when he left me, uh, he was the package. He, he, he'd taken all that information in and I trusted him to run the fridge of bacon for me. I've trusted him to run Midsummer for me because, you know, um, his mindset was in the correct place to, at that time because he, he, he understood Midsummer really well. I think that's the thing is understanding that every restaurant is different. Yeah. yeah. You have to adapt to the restaurant as well. Yeah. Which the is restaurant has to adapt to you. Yeah. But I think that is becoming a thing is that people would, would definitely probably not a midsummer, but people would want, maybe young chefs would expect you to adapt to them. Does that make sense? And that just, and if, and if they don't like it, then they'll just leave. Do you know what I mean by that? Why should the restaurant adapt? But it shouldn't. This is my point. I, it shouldn't at all. But it, I, I think it. I mean, look when we were at the Flitch. Why That's not? a prime example of people. Of we didn't adapt to the staff; they adapted to us. But there was only four of us in the end. Well, yeah, because the rest of them left because they didn't like what we. What, what the, they, it's not they didn't like the food we were doing. They didn't want to put the work in to make to make uh, that food consistent and to drive the business of where we wanted the business to go. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think the end of the day is, is uh, it's not, um, the reason you're coming to work at the restaurant is because of where the restaurant sits within the industry and the guidebooks and, and where it's going in places. You, you're not gonna go places by standing still and accepting second best. I think that's the truth. Yeah. 100%. So. 
you learn a lot then, Savian, from your time at <laughs> Midsummer. Loads, yeah. loads, loads, loads. Life skills as well. But it's not all just, you don't just learn about food, I think. There, you, you sort of, if you do proper time, you, you, and if you dedicate yourself to the to the place and to the chef, then you 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 take so much more from it. You know, you learn about everything, which is invaluable because a lot of places you wouldn't. A lot of places you could spend five years and you just you're really really good at cooking every single section in that in that kitchen. Um, but you learn, yeah, you, you, there's everything everything you could imagine that's relevant to to you know having a restaurant. Oh, no, you know, uh, I've I've. I've made lots of mistakes in my life, uh, not just uh, in the kitchen, but out of the kitchen. And, um, you know, I, 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 I use myself as an example, like with Sophia and I, we would spend many hours, just us two, prepping quails together or prepping the meat together or prepping the fish together. And you just don't just talk about food. You talk about, you know, what did you get up at the weekend? Did you do this? Did you do that? And then when they answer you, you sort of like you try and guide them and treat them, not like your children, but you try and she said, don't make that same mistake as me, because you know, look where I am now, you know. Yeah. And all of these things. And I and I try my hardest to say, you know, don't try and get to the top too quickly because yeah, they is it's, it's better to learn your craft properly. It's better to do this, it's better to do that. Think about things, travel, you know, experience, don't get married too quickly, don't do this, don't do that. Because the yeah, day is 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 you know, I treat them as friends and I treat them as they're important individuals to me. And as Sophie and said, the boys that do time, I still speak to on a regular basis. Yeah, I still text them, how are you? And make sure they're all right. And they text me and it's, it, they become part of the, the family and they are a part of the Midsummer tree in my eyes. Yeah, but so, so is Daniel someone that you would still come to for advice? So for example, obviously we're going to talk about your new role. Is that, is that something that you would talk to Daniel about yeah, yeah. we made that decision yeah 100% we we spoke on the phone about it I, I remember I don't know if you remember but it, we, we do, yeah. because it was such a for me it was a massive decision um and one that you know that that sort of decision you can't take lightly so obviously I we we spoke on the phone we spoke for ages about it I thought went away and thought about it and you know and I he was very honest with me what he thought about it um but I think with with that sort of decision that the own it's only you if, if you believe in yourself and you you know you're ready then it that's all that matters but but there's you know there's, there's other parts of it and there's things that I've questions I might not have asked that he would have reminded me about because it's not just about okay you can go in and cook whatever food you want there's so many other factors to it that I didn't you know that I wouldn't have even thought of um but yeah 100 percent yeah so is it important to have that then as a as a chef to have a, someone who's been in the industry like a, a mentor? Is that something that you'd say is, is important? Yeah, I think so. It's massively important. Some some if you're lucky enough to have it, then it, you're already a few steps ahead because you've got someone who's been doing it for I don't know how many, probably almost thirty years, giving you advice on you know one of the biggest career moves you're going to make. It's invaluable, <coughs> properly like properly. You know, they're important people to me. You know, Midsummer wouldn't be where it stands today without gentlemen like him and, and the others that have been through the kitchen. And I, and I think, yeah, that is, 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 as I said to you, they become friends. They become part of the family. My children know Sophie. If I, I, I said to my kids last night, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing a podcast with Sophie. Oh, how is he? Where is he? What's he up to? And they all know him. So the, at the end of the day is, is he becomes part of the family. And that, that's, that's, that's the truth is, is, is I wouldn't say a mentoring role. I just think sometimes I'm very black and white and I point out things that sometimes he's not seeing because it's okay to be given 90, 100 grand a year wages yourself. But if the rest of your kitchen budget's only 70,000, what, what can you get a sous chef and a chef to party and the rest you're doing on your jack? You've got to understand the way business is. The thing is about our, the way we grow up in kitchens is nobody teaches chefs that part of it until they are the chef. And then suddenly they've got to learn gross profits, payroll percentages, linen costs, electricity costs, gas costs, 
all of this. At the end of the day, is as a chef to party or a sous chef, you don't know any of that. You're like, you're more, yeah. You know, where's the saffron come? Where's this come from? Where's that come from? And then when you take that next role, it is a daunting role. And I think sometimes it's nice to have someone to bend an ear and say, oh, you know, chef, this is really shit. Yeah, I know. This is how I would deal with it. Okay, you might not deal with it the same way as me, but sometimes it's good just to have someone you can get off your chest because at the end of the day, is things do wind you up. And it's not until someone else says, you're being a bit of a dick there, that you actually realise, yeah, yeah, you're right, I am being a bit of a dick, and you go back and you be really nice to the boys. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky I've got Mark, because Mark, you know, does the same for me, and I do the same for him. So, Sophie, how is your new role at Alma? Are you settled? Are you, how are, you, are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah, it's gone It's gone really, really well. It couldn't, to be honest, it couldn't have gone better. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's probably a strange time to open a, a, a new, it's not a new restaurant, but it, you know, it was a, a team that had never worked together, um, completely different from what they were doing before. Um, and it's gone amazingly well. Like, it couldn't have gone better. The food's getting better every week. The staff are happy. Um, it's just, it's tick, ticking all the boxes. I'm sure, you know, as time goes on, there'll be, there'll be things, there'll be more little fires to put out here and there. But, you know, at, if someone had said to me, in, you know, in, in eight weeks, you'll be in this position, I'd be extremely happy. And, and I am, and the staff are happy, and that's that's it. That's that's all. That's all I'm asking for at this stage. And we just take it each week as it comes. Try and get better every week, um, and that's it. Which is, is that's where we are at the moment. I think you know the, the thing is 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 what's wonderful about it is is, and you can tell the reason that he was ready to take that role is, is the food is actually his. It's his creations. It's not stolen from other places. He's not gone in and taken a dish from here and a dish from there and put it on a menu and said, yeah, I'm the dog's bollocks. He's actually written the menu, put the work in, understood where the techniques are coming from, but it's a reflection of him. It's not copied by anyone else. I, 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 I really want to go there and I keep saying, I go, need to get down there, but we're open the same days. Yeah, so yeah. the thing is, is I know for a fact that he ain't going to open any extra days for me to go and eat there, and it means that I can't be here for service. So, so until the madness calms down and I can actually get a, a service off, it's a shame that I can't. I'm, I'm eating through Instagram at the moment, and it looks really tasty. So, <laughs> I've sent some friends there; they've loved it, and other chef colleagues have been and said it, how brilliant it is. And you know, he got a glowing report from the AA a couple of weeks ago. So things are yeah. definitely. Uh, he needs to be a bit more positive about what's going on because it looks fucking amazing. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm positive. I'm super positive. I couldn't be more. Huh? Good. Yeah, 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 really positive. <laughs> I couldn't be more. I'm very well, very well. How do you feel about, obviously it's a new role in cooking for chefs and things. How does that, does that bother you at all? Uh, not... I think, I think in, at the beginning, it was kind of the thought of, of, of doing it just the job was a little bit daunting. Um, but I, I didn't, like I said before, I b believed in myself. I brought a guy called Chris with me, um, who was, you know, someone that I really trust to have around me. Um, and I guess they're just like cooking for anyone else. If you, you shouldn't change it for anyone. You just do what we do and do, that's what it is. We just, and everyone who's cooking it, the whole team believe in it. So that's it. Don't, we don't change anything for anyone. We just try and give all the guests the best experience um, that we can. And if they're a chef, then hopefully they enjoy it. Hopefully. <laughs> what are the goals? Uh, for now, I think it, we, we take it week by week. We're not looking too far ahead because it's easy to get a bit overexcited and, and think you're, you're this and that. But we, we take it week by week. And just to keep, you know, to be to be busy, have a, a restaurant full of happy customers. That's 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 the goal, and all of the other, you know, the, all of the other bits will will fall into place because we're, we're we're headed in the right direction. But we're not in a rush. It's not, you know, we're not in a race to achieve anything in a certain amount of time. We just we take it week by week, and we keep getting better. But lo long term, it's you know, I think to to be sort of mentioned in the same breath of some, some, some of the other, you know, great restaurants in London is the direction that it's moving in. 
How was it going to London? Obviously, you've been to Ireland, you've been to Cambridge, yeah, to Marlow. You know, opening up in London. How did you feel about that? Um, honestly, I wasn't that bothered where it was. I said it to you, like it didn't. It didn't to me. It didn't matter where it was. Um, it just mattered that the the opportunity was right and the the setup was right and the restaurant was right. It could have been anywhere. So it didn't think about it too much in that sense. Um, but it was it was it was perfect. When I went to, to the place and went to see them and went to speak to them, and I realized that they had exactly the same view as me, it was a no-brainer completely. And what about Did, produce and suppliers? How's that in London? Well, I use all the uh, suppliers that I've used, you know, when I was with you, when I was with Tom, and, and taking that with me. Um, you get things a little bit later, it would be wrong, like you get, you know, lamb from Cumbria takes an extra hour and a half to come in, but you know, that's that's not the end of the world. Um, but yeah, it's it, for me, it didn't matter where it was. It could have been anywhere, as long as it was the right opportunity, which it is, and it, it, it's it gone it's gone really well. I wanted to talk to you both about no-shows, but I don't know, if, do they affect you or not? Just, uh, because it's, it's a bit of a topic that's, that's going around at the minute, where it's, people kind of it's not a new thing is it multiple booking and picking which one they want to go to and how do you how do you feel about no shows after coming out of such a tough 12 18 months well i've had one in eight weeks we've okay. we've had a few we've had we've had quite not not loads but it's i think the one thing that i noticed is that if you know we're closed sunday monday tuesday so if if we have a a no show of of eight covers on a on a saturday night it's uh it can be quite damaging because you know you have exactly the right amount of everything so you control your wastage so if you've got 30 covers booked you, you'll have 32 portions of lobster but if eight of those people don't turn up then what are you going to do with that lobster or with that whatever it is so it something that's happened it had was happening to us quite a lot um it's just a bit inconsiderate do you know what i mean they, they could pick up the phone and make a phone call um or whatever but it did yeah it was something that was happening to us the, the first few weeks quite a lot okay uh, do, do you take a, a prepayment for your bookings then or, or not Me? Uh, both of you it's, uh, it's I, I take a 50 pound deposit yeah yeah we've okay. we've we've started taking a 40 pound deposit and which i is, think to be honest with you i think the deposit system is they're entering into a contract. I think that contract gives them seven days to uh, cancel. Um, uh, if they, if, 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 if at the moment with COVID, because uh, people are having self-isolate, we're actually moving their reservations. But if it's actual people who've booked a table and they don't turn up, I look at it and think to myself, well, it ain't cost, it hasn't cost me anything. I'm a hundred pound better off. So. Yeah, that is, is uh, it's not great, it's not, but I think when you take a deposit, you know, people are very, very reluctant not to show up. So it does help in our case a lot. Yeah. 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 Why did, do you think people have such a, a strange, like kind of thought process around not showing up for restaurants? Because any other kind of entertainment- Well, Cara, you know, I'm being really funny. I, if uh, you're going out for a three and a half hour dining experience and you've had an argument with the missus before you go out, you don't want to spend three and a half hours sitting around a table looking at her, do you? Because yeah, it's not me being negative, it's me being honest. I, I can't answer the question of of um, why people don't turn up. But the, 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 the thing is, is, you know... Uh, I'd never thought about that before, Daniel, actually. that I've never thought that might be why people wouldn't want to... You don't know, do you? You don't know why they don't. They can pick up the phone, though, couldn't they? They can tell you. Good, but you, you know, and that's the difference. The thing is, is I think now you're in a more now you're in a head chef role. You'll start to hear reasons why people don't turn up. And when you know, we had someone ring up last week and saying we, you know, we have to cancel the table. Why? Well, John's died. Okay. Well, it was John's birthday. We were coming to celebrate. What? What? What can you do about that? No, well, you can't. But, but that's least, I mean, what you know, I want to say to you is, I think the end is is the way to eliminate it is to take take deposits. For the simple reason is, is they're entering into a contract, then aren't they? I, I'll be honest. If you're a standalone restaurants on the high street and you you're not taking any reservations, I think how can you staff for that? 
the end of the day is at least with the system that we've got in place, we can staff for it and we know we're covered. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, uh, we've spoke to quite a few restaurants that have had to close for like 10 days and someone's tested positive yeah. uh, for COVID. How, what does that mean for a restaurant? Like, what does the, Is that something that worries you at all? Um, 100%. I think the end of the day is that's the thing that goes through our minds every day as we open the door. For a simple reason is, is the staff go off for three days, they come back. Uh, you don't know where they've been. You can't really control where they've been. Are they going to bring COVID into the business? Are the customers going to bring COVID into the business? You know, the end of the day is, is you can't work two metres apart because there's not enough room in the kitchen and there's not enough hours of the day as there is, let alone with these current restrictions. So I think the self-isolating in the 10 days is, is, um, is catastrophic because the end of the day is... You, you, that's killing businesses. It's 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 making it very very difficult for places to operate because we don't have a security blanket. That's the thing. We don't have enough people in the background to bring in. It's not like a football team where eleven's playing, but you've got fifteen on the bench. This is eleven's playing. You needed fifteen, but you've only got eleven. And realistically, you take four or five of those out of the out of the thing. Yeah. You, you're fielding half a squad and half a squad's not going to bid Man United, are they? It's that simple. It's um, There's enough pressure on our shoulders as it is, but there's nothing we can do about it. <coughs> it happened to me last November. The week before that November lockdown, uh, my restaurant manager came in on the, the Wednesday and Wednesday night she turned around and said, Chef, I'm not feeling very well. And I said, right, okay, uh, you better do a test. She did a test. We closed the business. Uh, uh, I sent all the staff off to get tested. Three of them come back positive. Close the business on a Friday. Close the business on a Saturday. On a Sunday, Boris had locked the whole country down for a month. So I'd lost a full week's takings. But the thing is, is I'd lost a full week's takings, but I've got to pay all the staff anyway. So the, 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 the problem is with that is you'll have six good weeks and then you'll have one really bad week. And that bad week takes up all the profit and everything you've made on them six weeks. So as an employer, it, it, it is quite a frustrating thing. And not just that, I don't want to catch COVID. It's that simple. I, you know, the, the last thing is, I think I've done very well for 18 months not to catch it. And um, it's not on the top of my priority list to, to be in that situation myself or any of my staff. So again, is it, is it something that you think about? Obviously, the, the yeah. business and... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a worry. I think it'll, it'll always be a worry because it's, like you just said, it's, it's not going to go away. And now that people can go to nightclubs and not wear masks, it's only the, it's probably only going to happen more. And until, I guess, more people are vaccinated, I don't see what else you can do because you can't stay open. If, if, you, if three people get COVID in your kitchen, you can't stay open. And even if you have three people to replace them with, um, like th there's six other people who have been in contact with them. So it's just a bit of a vicious cycle. I think as, as more people get vaccinated, it will slow down and it will be happening less and less. Um, I've had one of, one of the kids have been self-isolating, yeah? One of your kids? Yeah, one of the kids have been self-isolating, went on a couch, went on a coach trip. Uh, if they didn't go on the coach trip, they failed their A-levels, but went on a coach trip, one of the kids on the coach got COVID. So far, they've sat in a bedroom at home on their own for seven days, testing every day, and they haven't got it, yeah? Now, I sit there and I think to myself, I understand that, why we've got to do it. But I think it's extremely frustrating for, for them to be at home knowing they haven't got COVID because, you know, and, you know, you have to leave bottles of water outside their room and take their dinner up and leave it on a tray. It's, it's you know, it's, they're going to pay for that when I'm older because they're going to do the same for me. But the yeah, day is... is uh, <laughs> I see uh, I'm my dad. actually. It sounds quite nice. <laughs> there, is, there is a benefit to everything, but my standard of food will be a bit higher. But um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, what I'm trying, my point of getting across is, is, is that's incredibly frustrating for everybody to be in that situation, especially when at the end of the 10 day isolation, that person actually hasn't got it. It's positive the country's coming back out of lockdown, but I think it's also 
it's putting the risk onto businesses. And I think the end of the day is, is the hospitality industry right now doesn't need that pressure because there's so much else going on within it that uh, it's, it's only going to have a domino effect where it's going to see a lot of places suffer even harder than they have. Talking about coming out of lockdown, let's go a completely different way. What's the best meal that you've had out since since you've come out of lockdown? I haven't eaten anywhere. Have you not? Nowhere. Have you got somewhere in mind when you finally get some time? I wanted to go to Deterra, actually. I was speaking to one of my mates about it the other day at the Town Hall Hotel. Um, I think it's there. It looks really, okay. really good. Uh, most of mine are in Europe now. Uh, I want to go to Mazar in France. So that's top of the list. Uh, I really want to go to Japan. Uh, I want to understand that culture a lot better. Um, you have to wait till we're allowed to go anywhere. I think eating out has become a lot more special for me now. So I think uh, uh, I'm going to uh, try my hardest to eat in better restaurants and less regularly, but uh, more of a special occasion. So, yeah, there's a couple of two stars and three stars in this country I'd like to go and eat at. Obviously, Sofian's place. Uh, one of our other lads at the Fat Ducks, I'd like to go back and see them. Um, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I'll be honest with you, I've enjoyed cooking at home more than ever because it's given me the opportunity to spend with the kids. So, uh, you know, I made pizzas on Sunday night and I, I sat there after I made nine pizzas in the garden. I stood there and worked how much that would have cost me if I'd have got it from Domino's. And, uh, of course you did. I'm, no, no, of course I did. Yeah. You know, normally I'm not there, am I? So normally I am picking up the bill. But I'm not trying to say to you is I, 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 first of all, I got them involved in making the pizzas. But second of all, I looked at how much it would have cost me. And I thought to myself, you know what, 250 quid on pizzas or make nine, nine pizzas with the kids and, and see their faces. It was better to do it yourselves. I think that's the trick that's come out of this is we've all learned to cook better food at home. Do you think it's interesting you say that? Do you think it's changed... Uh, well, both of you, has it changed because of the way you are about going out to eat? Because a lot, I think it has changed for a lot of people. We've got so used to being at home that it's almost like it an effort now, isn't yeah. it? It's more of an effort to go out because you got so used to not doing it. I, I think this has changed everyone's perspective because, because we haven't had to go out. You haven't bought any new clothes. Yeah? You haven't done this. You haven't travelled London. You haven't... You haven't you, the money people have saved by not socialising so much and the way it's changed their lives, some people are reflecting on saying, I'm really missing it. And some people are saying, actually, I can cut a lot of this out. I spoke to Sat last week and Sat said to me, you know, Daniel, uh, I've simplified my life. I, 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 I've made a difference to my life. It's made me think about things that are more important. And I think I can concur with that. I like to go home on a Saturday night and... I don't like to hear from anyone until Monday evening. And, and I'll be totally honest with you, that makes me the happiest in the world. <laughs> yeah. Just shutting yourself up away yeah, from I do. the world. I love, it. I, love, I love, do you know what? I, I just love uh, the freedom. I love the freedom of uh, uh, what lockdown has taught me is that, yeah, I am a very good chef, but I, I actually, if I take what's, the way my brain works, it doesn't, I, I don't know if it's special, I don't know what it is, but I, I think about food differently to a lot of people. And uh, I, I can make a curry without picking up a recipe. And, and, and if, like, because I understand the way the taste is, I sort of can recreate that in my head and then in the pan. And I, can, I think I can make a, a, a chicken korma or a chicken tikka probably as good as my local Indian. So why would I go out? You need to have that competition. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, there is a really good Indian here, and I love it to bits. I just, I think um, the price of, price of eating out now has rocketed everywhere, and I think the other day is if I'm going to go out for a meal, it's got to be special because um, I can do most of it at home. That's how I feel. It might be arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie, what about you? Has it changed the way you um, think about going out or have you missed it? No, I, I think I've missed it. I, I like going out. I like, you know, even if it's just for lunch or whatever, I, I think that it's, that's been taken away for the last 18 months. So, and now it's back. I think you should, we, everyone should take full, uh, you know, full advantage of it. But it's, it's true. I think people have, 
I think there'll be sort of 50% of people who'll be like, well, I can, I've done all of this myself at home for the last year and a half. Um, so why am I going to pay in, uh, a lot of money to go and eat out or whatever? I mean, I, I like it. I like the idea of going out. I like going out. Um, but I think there will be a lot of people who would prefer to stay in and they probably enjoy cooking more than they did beforehand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like Chef said, it's food's pretty expensive. It's, it's expensive. Even if you just grab something small for lunch, it's not cheap. What are your kind of, what are your plans uh, for, for the future? Would you, do you see yourself as having your, having your own restaurant, Sophie? And are you going to write a book? Like, oh, no books. Jesus. No, no books? No, 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 no books. Um, I think for now, it's my, my focus completely is, is the restaurant and the hotel. And it's not, I'm not looking past that. I'm not, you know, planning ahead of that. I think we just, we, we want to establish ourselves um, and keep doing what we're doing and keep getting better. Um, and that's it. I mean, yeah, the, the, the restaurant's my main focus. I don't want to look past that at all. Um, so yeah, that's it. I'm very proud of him and I'm very proud that he's uh, settling in, getting great reviews and he's got his head on his shoulders and, and, and that, that, you know, that is a credit to himself because the journey that he's on is, is in his own shoes now and that's lovely to see that someone is standing strong and enjoying it because this industry is something you should be, it should be enjoyed, it should be uh, celebrated and he is the future so Good luck to him. Thank you. It must, it must be very nice to see people that you've had in your kitchens go on and do. I, I, knew, I knew this one was special. He's like a uh, <laughs> Jedi master. But I think, uh, <laughs> I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, there's, you know, the, the, the certain ones that you know, they've got that glint in their eye and they've got that, that passion and you can see the way they cook and the way they present themselves. It was always there for him. And uh, I think he's found the perfect place for him to go. And, you know, Let's all rush down there and get ourselves a table and get that place booked out because uh, yeah, I think that's that's what everyone needs. The the industry needs uh, to highlight where the, the true professionals are and the ones that really care. And he is one of those ones that care. And uh, yeah, I'll be first down there to eat when I can get out. Right. Thank you both so much. I've really enjoyed it. Um, Daniel, thank I will you. speak to you again soon. Sophie, and good luck with everything. Um, thank you so and much. thank you both very much. Perfect. Okay, so I'll see you soon, Chief. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.